Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Brosius. I'm the lead pastor of this church, and I'm here to rock. Well, I'm here. we're here to have fun, actually. But I love the uh, jukebox series because uh, <laughs> I love the jukebox series because you can really get into some of the denser stuff, and you can have fun. People's eyes don't glaze over, and it's stuff that really applies to their life. We're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff today. I'm not going to preach in this wig the whole time, I promise. And uh, I just really laughed when I thought about it, and I couldn't help it. So the cool thing about that Warrant song, though, is I used to make fun of it when I was a kid, and I made fun of it for several reasons. I think I think I was a 90s kid, and so if you grew up in the 90s, it, a lot of the music that you listened to in the 90s was making fun of the 80s, or, or it was like a reaction to the 80s. And then I, I got older, and I realized that um, I was basing my identity based off of a commodity, off of a product from a business that was also selling the other records. And uh, I didn't like being manipulated like that. And so I, I learned that I could probably appreciate the 80s stuff. And then um, I, I, also made, I also made fun of stuff like that because I was kind of a church kid, okay? And so when I grew up in the church, we were aware of a culture that was slipping away from Jesus. We were aware that, especially like in the late 80s, um, a lot of people made themselves look like uh, they like God. They wore crosses. They thank God at their award ceremonies, and they were living like crazy rock and roll lifestyles. And uh, I guess, I don't, know, I, I don't know if anybody was raised seeing the documentary, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you saw it? Okay. But uh, yeah, you became, I was aware of the music business moving away from, Christianity. And so I was like, that's a really, that's really kind of, uh, they don't, they're not talking about heaven. They're, they, they don't understand Jesus. And what, what I really liked is as I got to understand how heaven works a little bit, I realized that Warrant kind of has a better view of um, heaven than most theologians. We didn't listen to the song, did we? Put the song on real quick. Just like the words of Paul right there. You know, it's just like straight out of Corinthians. Man, I, I really, one of my uh, favorite moments of all time was um, when my wife listens to mix 90, no, it's 96.3 sometimes. It's, no, which one is the... Uh, it's one of the mixed stations, and, and, we, and I'm in the car, and I always listen to Air One, usually, because I'm more spiritual, and uh, I, I, I'm in the car, and I'm driving down the road, and, and, uh, and on comes this Bruno Mars song, and, and I was just like, it, I mean, that song, it just played just like a worship song, you know, and I'm in my car, hands raised at the red light, stopped, you make me feel like I've been locked out of heaven, and it didn't take me long before I was like, this song is not about Jesus, you know, like, oh my gosh, but it, it, that, it doesn't have to be about Jesus to be a worship song, it was a worship song, so, uh, and a well-crafted worship song, but what I, I like about it just hit me that this is this is more correct because one of the things I've learned about heaven is I've always hoped to go to heaven when I die until I realized that um, we maybe we go to heaven when we die, but we, that's not our eternal destination. The Bible doesn't teach that we go to heaven when we die. The Bible teaches that we are physically resurrected and that we are living on a new earth united with a new heaven. The great goal of Christianity is not to go to heaven. It's bringing heaven to earth. Um, Jesus, when he teaches his disciples to pray, teaches them to ask that God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When heaven comes to earth, the earth operates as if God is in total control because everything is operating according to God's will. And 
the crazy thing about heaven is that over the past 200 years, the, the questions about what Jesus has to say about heaven and how heaven interacts with this world have been very, very sharp. You may not hear this in the pulpit very often, but the scholarship, which really impacts you, has been all over the place. There is a guy named um, Schleiermacher, who I bet you nobody here has heard of Schleiermacher, but believe me, you have been impacted. I know you've heard of Schleiermacher, but so Schleiermacher is the one of, is probably the most prolific, uh, one of the most prolific New Testament scholars of the of the past two hundred years. He's frequently compared to John Calvin as as a, as an equal in intellect to John Calvin, but he's not an orthodox Christian. So after, after the Enlightenment and after the Romantic period, p- humanity begins to see itself as rational beings, scientific beings who can understand the world. And Christianity isn't rational to them. Christianity is supernatural. And therefore, we don't believe in superstition. And the Romantic period comes afterwards, and they say, no, we're not just purely scientific beings. We like to be united with nature. We like to read poetry. That connects us with our own human nature. We want to be connected with who we are in the world that we see. And Schleiermacher looks at this, and he says, oh, man, these people don't want anything to do with traditional Christianity. And he comes from a movement in Christianity called pietism. Pietism, it just means that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You feel your relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's not merely an academic endeavor. That's what John Wesley comes out of. That's what the Methodist movement comes out of, and so does Schleiermacher. So Schleiermacher says... Religion is not something that you just find in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible has, has, clearly has errors in it because it appeals to superstition. You find God in your feelings. It's this feeling of utter dependence on God that gives you your relationship with God. Now, we can still read the Bible, but we just have to filter it a little bit. Schleiermacher is probably like, I think some people call him the father of hermeneutics, the father of being able to interpret texts. It doesn't just apply to the Bible, it applies to all kinds of other literary genres. And so all kinds of people come after him and they say, we're gonna interpret the Bible correctly. We're going to find what the Jesus of history really looks like. Because we know the Bible has added mythology on top of it. They added things that we know aren't true. And they added this Jesus that is doing miracles, but he's just a great teacher. And you can read like their stuff. If you take undergraduate um, Christianity, you'll see Jesus didn't really walk on the water. He was walking on the shore, and the water was hitting him at the ankles. And they're like, oh, it's like he's walking on the water, man. And and they, they come up with these kinds of explanations. And then this guy named Albert Schweitzer comes along. And Albert Schweitzer says, when these people are, are finding the Jesus of history, All they're doing is finding a Jesus who talks and thinks exactly like they do. They're not finding the real Jesus of history. But he wasn't a defender of Jesus either. He says that Jesus was crazy. Jesus predicted the end of the age. And the end of the age didn't come. He predicted the kingdom of heaven was going to come. And yet there's still evil in the world. Why is there a Christianity believing in Jesus who incorrectly predicted the end of the world? And this is influential because even Christians go along with this. I just read a quote from C.S. Lewis talking about how Jesus 
was incorrect in predicting the end of the world. We're going to read a passage in Scripture that really, um, really points in that direction. And we're going to unpack it real quick, and we will talk about how heaven does interact with the world that we are in. I cut some verses out just because, um, for multiple reasons, but my, part of it is I'm trying not to preach for an hour. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these things are beginning of birth pains. Then you... Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. For where... Well, that's coming. But, so when I read this passage, there's several things that really jump out. You could preach off this passage for like a long time. There's so much here. It is such a debated passage, and it's frequently read way outside of its historical context. And if you were to read this passage in context, you will get entirely different views of it than you would if you were reading it without its context. First thing that we notice when we read this passage is that Jesus has just left the temple and he has condemned the temple. He has said, look at the buildings. None of these stones that make up this building are going to be standing on top of one another, which is clearly a which is clearly an exaggeration because like the the wailing wall is that what it's called it's still there. But the temple is about to get destroyed. That's what he's calling. And then he, he calls upon the abomination that brings desolation, which is actually applicable in two ways. Number one, it's talked about in the prophet Daniel. We're not going to read that passage because I'm not preaching for an hour. But it, and then Israel gets invaded during the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't get into it too much. They desecrate the temple by sacrificing a pig. And we, I, I really am going to talk to Charlena about doing a Hanukkah service in a way that is 
uh, like the, I don't know how the Messianic Jews do it, but it'd be fun because it really, really sets the, the precedent for understanding the teachings of Jesus. So it's talking about Jesus. And then it talks about Jesus coming on the clouds. Do you know where else in the Bible Jesus is moving on the clouds? Also in the book of Daniel, the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Which direction is the Son of Man going when he's going on the clouds? Is he returning into the sky on the clouds? I'm not going to read it because it's not too long, but I promise you, if you read it, the Son of Man is ascending on the clouds, approaching the Ancient of Days, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, taking his reign. There is something about what's happening here with the temple that is associated with Jesus taking his reign as king. If you read N.T. Wright, he talks about it in every book he writes because he kind of repeats himself sometimes. But his book, How God Became King, is a must read. It's very accessible. So Jesus, when he is in the desert with the serpent, with Satan, Satan offers him to, to become the king of the world. And Jesus turns him down because Jesus is not establishing his heavenly reign through methods of force. There's something about his willingness to die, to take all of the evil upon himself, to be resurrected, and then to be seated at the right hand of God the Father that brings his heavenly kingdom to earth. And it's associated somehow with the temple. And now there's this third verse here, which if you read that thing, it gives, it gives it away, that I never really even paid any attention to until my dad started asking me about it. This passage is where the carcass lies, there the vultures gather. Jesus says that. What is the carcass? Why are there vultures gathering around the carcass? But here's the thing. This is weird. The word vultures isn't the word that Jesus uses. Every translation in English except the King James mentions vultures. Why would they mention vultures? Because vultures eat carcasses. Eagles do not. Eagles kill alive things. Vultures, I think they also sometimes do kill alive things. But they, but, but they mostly eat dead things. Thank goodness for what they do on the side of our roads. I'm grateful for vultures. But why would Jesus talk about eagles? Bring that up. Yeah. What's it? Wheresoever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What is it about eagles that makes sense to the, his original audience that doesn't make sense to us reading it out of context? What is it that they would know about eagles that we don't know? Because I promise you, they know exactly what Jesus is talking about. They may not know how it's going to pl flesh out, but they know because they see it on a regular basis. You want to bring up that slide, David? These are Roman soldiers. You see that giant scepter? I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a scepter. I don't know what that thing is. That giant pole they're holding on top of it is an eagle. Look at their shields. Eagle wings. Look at their flag that they carry. Eagles. What's the carcass? The temple. Jesus has just declared that the temple is dead. The temple is illegitimate. 
there's a carcass in the middle of Jerusalem, not the side of the road. Nobody knows it's dead. And he talks about the, the abomination that brings desolation, which is when Syria attacks him. And he says, don't, flow, don't run for the hills. Don't gather because Israel gathers and they throw Syria off. He's saying that's not going to happen this time. And there's something about this that establishes that he's the legitimate king of Israel. Because Jesus doesn't come to force people to follow him. Jesus doesn't reign by coercion. By coercion. He doesn't force you to follow him. We talked two weeks ago, we were preaching on the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus calls her a dog, right? How offensive that would be to call a woman a dog today, yet Jesus does it. Because Jesus came for Israel. Jesus came for Israel because that is his people. And some of those people who are in Israel are going to choose to follow him. This is not an anti-Semitic message. Not at all. It can be used that way. Oh my gosh, can it be used that way? But that's not the intention of the author. They are manipulating the author's intentions. But most of the early Christians were Jewish. But as a nation, they are rejecting their king. And if you read the book of John, they reject their king because they're afraid their king is going to get their temple destroyed. The resurrection of Lazarus, they're like, if we don't do something about this, we don't kill this dude. Romans are going to come and they're going to destroy our place of worship. And it, they reject the king. And within the first generation, those people were still alive. The zealots take control of Israel. They throw out, they can kill all the Romans that are in that area. They take control. But it's not an organized revolt because a lot of people have a lot to lose, and they're not all behind it. When they threw off the Syrians, it was extremely well-organized guerrilla warfare. It's not in this situation. Two Roman generals come, General Vespasian and Titus, both of whom are well-known because they are prolific Roman generals, and they destroy Israel. The rumor is, I don't know if it's true or not, they didn't want to destroy the temple. They wanted to put a Roman emperor's statue in there, make it for Caesar, but it caught on fire, and then they destroyed it. So... They rejected their king because they wanted to protect their temple. And that's what led to the destruction of their temple. Jesus has established himself as legitimate. And the destruction of the temple is when Christianity and Judaism become fully split. Until then, it's kind of like two cells that are, that, that are like reproducing. It's clearly different, but it's still attached to the other thing. They split after the, the falling of the temple. Jesus predicted something that did happen. But you can go in the opposite direction. Albert Schweitzer said that Jesus falsely predicted the end of the age. And um, if you look here, he predicted something that literally happened. You can go in the opposite direction uh, for uh, the guy who, who went after Schweitzer like 40 or 50 years later, this guy named Rudolf Boltman. Many of you have not heard of him, but I promise you, he is very, very important. Of course, I know you've heard of him. And uh, Rudolf Boltman goes in the opposite direction. He says, Jesus doesn't predict the end of the world. He predicts that the kingdom of heaven is available to us now. He follows Schleiermacher. He doesn't believe in supernatural activity. He just believes that the kingdom of heaven brings you into this situation that helps you navigate your world and make meaning of it. He doesn't even talk about redemption. But boy, was he influential. He was very, very, very influential. Christianity, like the Orthodox people, 
had nothing to offer in return. They couldn't be taken seriously. They couldn't be taken seriously because their scholarship wasn't there. They were not even engaging with this stuff. They just stayed separate. They left, they were in a ghetto. I mean, I think this is after the Scopes trial. They're being lampooned on the radio. Everybody's reading Freud. Everybody's reading about um, all kinds of precedent that's going to lead to the sexual revolution that's coming soon, and they are fleeing. They are, they, to even engage the culture at that time, in like the 30s and 40s, meant that you were a liberal and they wanted nothing to do with you. Their seminaries had been taken from them by liberals. They had to start their own. They were terrified. And I'm, I'm literally dedicating this sermon to the people who started Fuller Seminary. Because with Fuller Seminary is the beginning of Christianity's reemergence into our culture. I got a book on it. I'm writing, writing a book that mentions it, so you're getting more than I anticipated giving you. But I won't go too far. I'm not preaching hour-long sermons. So there's a guy. I think his name's Charles Fuller. He was well listened to all across America. And he decides that he's going to create a seminary that's like Princeton, again, that has the ability to engage the culture. And it's built based on fundamentalism but they begin to interact with Karl Barth, who we'll get into another week on a good song. It's coming. But because Karl Barth questions inerrancy, he doesn't question the authority of the Bible, he questions inerrancy. This sets on a civil war within Christianity and within Fuller Seminary. They have to answer questions that they are philosophically unequipped to be able to handle. But what emerges is the kind of scholarship like the book I'm about to show you on the screen. The book that changed Christianity's trajectory. It's, it, it's, it's the most, I, I think it might be the most important book of the 20th century. But I, I don't know all the other books. This right here is from Fuller Seminary's um, George Eldon Ladd. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, but he is... He just changed everything. There is no vineyard movement without George Ed Eldon Ladd. John Wimber learned under John, uh, George Eldon Ladd. His theology is the basis for everything. There is no N.T. Wright without George Eldon Ladd. There is no Dallas Willard without George Eldon Ladd. N.T. Wright and Dallas Willard didn't really read much of each other, but they, but they like fit like a glove because of this guy. Did Jesus predict the end of the age mistakenly? Did he predict that the kingdom of God was coming to earth without? Or did he do both? How can you do both? How can you predict that the kingdom of heaven is coming to earth and that's going to happen within history and happen at the end times. How can you have both? I'm gonna use a big word, and I'm sorry, I hate using this big word, because it's the big word that all pretentious Christian people use as soon as they learn it. Eschatology means studying the end times, okay? George Eldon Ladd in, brings in one phrase that changes the Christian scholarship forever. He says this is, inaugurated eschatology. Jesus is inaugurating the end times. He's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, and the kingdom of heaven is on earth, but the kingdom of heaven has not fully come yet, has not fully consummated the age. It, the kingdom of heaven has an inauguration, but has not yet felt its consummation. The kingdom of God is where God's will is being done on earth. There is no place, no time on earth 
when the earth has been following God's will more than when Jesus Christ himself was on the planet. Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is more than that. But Jesus is the in-breaking kingdom of God. And the kingdom is still here, even though Jesus has risen. Do you know why? Because Jesus has passed his authority on to his church. He sent another advocate to live with us, to be his church, to be his temple, to be his already heaven yet not fully heaven when you're when you listen to vineyard people like the main pastors they always talk about the already and the not yet they usually use it to describe why miracles sometimes happen but sometimes don't happen they're like the kingdom of heaven's here so miracles happen it didn't happen there because kingdom of heaven's not yet fully here you hear that over and over again that but that already not yet thing can be applied to our lives, and it can be applied to our lives in powerful, powerful ways. You, in your prayer, approach a split veil. You approach the Ancient of Days. You have access to the throne room of God when you pray. When you pray, God hears your prayers. But God does more than just answer your prayers. God forms you in your prayers. Your heart is shaped because you sit because you sit in the presence of a God who loves you and sees potential in you that you don't yet see in yourself. A God who wants you to be like a little Jesus in the world around you. And what you get from your prayer life and your already connected to heaven prayer life gets to become part of your not yet heaven outer life in the civil community. You get to bring the kingdom of heaven to bear on earth when you are formed in the presence of your Lord and Savior. The kingdom of heaven is where the will of the Lord is done on earth as it is in heaven. As your heart becomes molded by the will of God, your actions will begin to reflect the will of God. And they will gradually, imperfectly, bring about consequences that reflect the will of God. Do you think about that ever? how your connection with God, as it changes your actions, has the ability to have the will of God break into the world around you. You don't have to manipulate your friends to bring them into church. Your authentic relationship with Jesus bringing your, your authentic redemption in your heart, bringing your authentic love for the world that you get through your prayerful lens that you developed in prayer. That's all you need to do. Be yourself. You know, be yourself. Repent often, but do not be anything less than who you are. Even if that means you have no idea if people are going to laugh at you wearing a mullet on the, on the stage. There's one thing I, I've, one thing I did when I planted this church is I tried to figure out how to get a, a church with people who are willing to resolve conflict, stay present with one another, not, not, um, not like write each other off, not run away, but to really navigate conflicts that lead to genuine human relationships. And I, I mean, I, I read books on this. I talked to people, and really, at the end of the day, the best piece of advice just came from Matt Kingston when we were eating barbecue. He said, if you want that to happen, you just got to embody that yourself. He's like, if you, if you do that, 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 that's the kind of church you're going to develop. 
And he's right. But I'm not the only person that gets to decide what this church is like. I'm not. I love that phrase. And maybe that's where that, one of the places where that came from. You be the church you want to see in the world. What is it that you have a core need of inside of you that you don't feel like gets met on a regular basis? Do you have any core needs like affirmation? Do you feel invisible? Do you feel like a failure? Do you feel insignificant? Do you need people to affirm stuff inside of you? The one thing I've learned, because I've spent a lot of time in therapy, a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of money in therapy, um, the more personal your pain is, the more personal your problems are, the more universal those problems usually are. They are spread around. Maybe not everybody has that. If you start trying to meet core needs in the community that reflect your core needs, it's like you're being shaped as someone who has the ability to shape the community because you get the help build this culture. When you take your core needs and meet them in other people, you're bringing the kingdom of God to bear on this church. You have that privilege of changing the world by being authentic. Who you are is who you are but when you stand before God. You have the ability to show that to the world. And that's what changes it. It will not be a VBS program. It will not be um, a, a super relevant church series. And I get that this is not a relevant church series. A 20-year-old a, a mixtape that was on TV at 3 o'clock in the morning for bands that were 20 years old then is not relevant and I just don't care. I don't care. It's better that you're yourself. I really, I have a sermon written for Bruno Mars Flowers that I wanted to preach last summer. And I have a sermon afterwards from Miley Cyrus's Flowers. And that would be super relevant. But I'd rather do this. So just be yourself. Be yourself before God. You stand before the Ancient of Days. Do you believe that? Do you believe your prayer life puts you before the throne room of God, a God who knows you better than you know yourself? Remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about how God will put tests in your path like the Seraphonician woman? He doesn't test you because he's trying to find out something about you that disqualifies you. He's trying to teach you something about yourself. Because God wants you to be changed. He wants you to bring redemption into the core of who you are. He wants that redemption to be received by the world. So what would your life look like if the kingdom of God was what shaped it? Would it look different? How would you approach your upcoming week if you were thinking about the kingdom of God coming to bear over the course of your week? I'm just going to say... It's because of what Jesus did that this is possible. I hope that I haven't actually preached for 44 minutes. I literally tried not to. But that's part of what I'm asking for forgiveness for in communion. Now, I hand it over.